Well, um, I'm now in my 88th year and I come from a mining family born in the Rhondda Valley, which is known at least in the mining industry throughout the country. And my family uh, was a very typical family for the Rhondda in the sense that on my mother's side, her parents came down from North Wales into the mining valley. And on my father's side, my grandfather came from the west of England. Because when the coal industry really took off the ground at that time, and that's many, many years ago, the population in the Rhondda could be counted on two or three hands. And my father always used to relate, being told by old residents, there was a time in the Rhondda Valley when a squirrel could get up into a tree in Blind Rhondda or Blind Combe, top of the valley, and travel down to Porth without touching the ground. And my father used to relate that. But once steam coal had been found, and it was steam power that opened up the mining industry. While there was coal being dug out in the Rhondda, in seams in the side of the mountains, and coal that was being taken down uh, to other parts of uh, Glamorgan County and being used. So when, when was that? What year would that, would that have been? What year were we talking about? Well, that would have been back... Um, well, as I'm saying, I'm, I'm 88 now. My father, God, I don't know how old he'd be. Um, it was way back, way back, you know. Because my father then, um, when he started working underground, and my grandparents on both sides of the family, it was steam power provided the means by which they could sink down into deeper seams. It wasn't possible before. And with the advent of steam power, it really opened up the coal industry and conversely, the provision of coal opened up other major industries. And when you look back, both in the First World War and again in the Second World War, it was coal and steel power kept the British fleet af afloat. So are we talking about... I, I, I could be criticised for this by either by, uh, other miners. The best steam coal came from the Rhondda and it, it was acknowledged, you know, and we're very proud of that. When I was uh, 15, um, no, very little choice. And I tell you, um, my mother did everything possible to keep me and my two older brothers out of, out of mining. And I'll tell you why. Uh, in 1939, my father was buried in a roof fall underground and had his right leg amputated and a very bad high, what they call a high amputation, near uh, his hip. And there was no compensation under the mine, coal mining industry, the private coal owners then. And my mother was determined. I was one of five, three boys and two girls. And my mother was determined to keep us out of the pits. And she succeeded in keeping my oldest brother, Ken, from going underground. But what then happened was, conscription was current in the armed forces. And at 18, we not only lost a breadwinner, but he became a burden to our family. Because when he was off in the army, when he came home, when he did come home for a weekend or anything like that, we had to keep him. So we were 
confronted with in our family, which is not untypical, you know, large families then. And with due regard to my mother, there was no option because if I had followed in my brother's footsteps, I would have become a burden to the family. And I had another brother between me and my eldest brother. Well, it brought out the best and the worst in humanity. I'll put it that way. Because it was an exclusively male atmosphere and it afforded the right for the worst possible elements and some of the best elements of humanity to come out, you know. But the predominant um, atmosphere that existed was a very positive and a good one because the type of work that we were involved in necessitated a very close comradeship, understanding and a broad, wider interest in your fellow workers. The industry and the atmosphere underground demanded that that stood out above all else because of the type of work and the conditions under which we were working. Really dire condition, even when I went underground, you know, at that time, you know. Did everyone have the same, everyone was in it together? Uh, there were scallywags, or if that's the right word. Uh, they were uh, very quiet uh, uh, mine workers who didn't have a uh, peep out of them. Others, you couldn't stop them what we used to call loud-mouthed comrades in the... But, but there was a command... What's the word? Camaraderie. 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 Camaraderie, which was necessary because you, you depended. And I don't want to um, uh, say uh, it, it was a be-all and end-all of things underground, but no, the comradeship and uh, working together was a necessity because we were working in very dangerous conditions underground, constantly. And it involved knowing that your fellow workers were there instantly, if and when necessary, you know. And, um, uh, for instance, uh, I, I had my first first day certificate underground as a young man. And I carried what we used to call an ambulance box and we had a team and I got photographs of our young um, first aid team and we used to compete from the pits and it was encouraged you know uh, but I also uh, coming from my family background where my father was very politically involved in the community and was um, a, a strong advocate of the trade union, you know, and he was penalised for that, my father, like many others. And I came up in that atmosphere, you know, and I was first elected onto the pit lodge. And I was first elected onto the pit lodge committee at 16 years of age because at that time in South Wales uh, in South Wales there was there was a mining industry up north but there were only about one or two pits that were predominantly in South Wales the Derbyshire coalfield Kent coalfield and the Scottish coalfield at the time when I entered the industry started setting up youth advisory councils in the union with the view of encouraging miners to take an active interest in the trade unions. How would you have been on your... Uh, my father lost his leg as a young man 
with three of us, five of us in the family to support, and there was no compensation, no compensation there. So it depended on his on the workforce to help my father. Uh, and even when I started working at underground, there was a tradition there which still carried on. Every payday, every Friday, when men assembled to collect their pay in the works office on top of the pit, there was a collection taken every Friday because there was no compensation. When, you know, there was when I started in the pit, but they kept on that tradition. And uh, so did, did people give money willingly? Yes. Oh, God, yes. Because they knew. Well, this, this was the comradeship that existed, you know, and, and it, it was uh, absolutely necessary, you know. And um, I can remember my father saying, I'm trying to recall now uh, what the term he used to use. Um, oh, yes. Under the private call owners, a death underground was regarded as an act of God. Yeah. And, and there was no compensation. It was, it, it, that, that was, uh, you know, uh, and I can't remember if somebody just lost their leg and I say it that way, you know, or smashed their arm or uh, had a fracture of their skull or something like that. I don't know what language they use, but that again was tough, mate. There was no compensation. So was that an act of God in the eyes of... My father had his first artificial leg as a result of a string of concerts organised in clumps and pubs up and down around the valley. And it so happened that one of my father's school friends with a lovely singing voice, his father owned a string of wine stores across South Wales. No financial problems. And he, on the hearing of my father's plight, organised, and he was a wonderful singer, and I can remember him as a kid, because his house on Christmas, when we went to write singing carols, was one of the first ones we went to, because we knew we'd have a couple of pennies. Mm. So I knew the chap. And it was he, as a wonderful singer, organised concerts up and down the valley to raise funds to buy a new leg for my father. And that was, that was quite... A The, the, the start of the decline of the industry was uh, well before the most recent um, campaigns and strikes and in this valley over saving Tower Pit and that sort of thing because of course there was a period where Coal was almost exclusively the basic means of power and energy, not just in Britain. It was that era, you know. But with the advent of oil, which then became uh, a source of world energy, for, of creating power and energy, the decline of the industry was already starting then. So... Way back in the late 60s and 70s, you know, with... See, after the end of the Second World War, the energies and ideas and the concerns in all countries was to redevelop their economies from a war economy, and I'm talking primarily 
about the major powers in the world, which dominated nearly all other countries, because we were a colonial power, not only back in the 80s, you know, we were still a colonial power, right up until the end of the Second World War, you know, and with the opening up of uh, the oil industry, new sources of energy, new technology reached the stage. I'm generalising now, as you appreciate, and I don't pretend uh, to have exclusive knowledge and experience in all these industries. But uh, in a nutshell, the real challenge to coal started after the Second World War. When the means and technology became available to exploit and develop other major sources of energy that hitherto were beyond the reach of mankind. So are we talking about um, people like Rock? Well, yes, uh, but what we have to acknowledge is, and I'm talking again about the immediate period after the Second World War, with the discovery of oil, right? That oil potential, the potential oil industry, could not, not to make a pun of it, get off the ground or out of the ground without the technology of the major economies. So we were able as a country to develop so, so oil fields like America was able to. America was, could do it internally, you know, but also in the, in the former colonies and particularly in uh, in the uh, Middle East and the Arab countries, all that oil was for no bloody use unless you can get it out of the ground, boys. Mm. We are the technology. So this then was yet another means by which Britain could start developing and continuing as a major power. Simple economics. And even I, as an ex-coal miner, was able to grasp and understand that. Well, I, I, I'd left, left the industry by then. Um, and uh, I went out then into work in construction, you know. Um, and I worked on the construction of uh, the Slanwyn Steelworks in Newport. Um, I, was work I was managing um, a, a plant hire company specialising in um, generators, uh, compressors, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I also worked on the construction of the steelworks um, up north. My memory is <laughs> not all that good. Um, up in Teesside. Uh, and I also worked on the oil refineries down in Pembroke. Uh, because the, the particular plant, the particular plant that we used, you know, uh, were mobile uh, generators, welding plant, and uh, compressors, and that sort of thing, you know. So I, that's what I uh, did after I left the mining industry, um, and where are we by now? Eighty. In, in the eighties, yeah. And uh, I continued in that field. Uh, I I finished work when the last miners' uh, strike had taken place, and uh, I was involved locally, uh, campaign to save Aberdeen Hospital, which we succeeded in doing, and Mount Hospital. And also, I was involved with other members, uh, comrades, and friends in running an advice centre, voluntary advice centre in Green Street Chapel, uh, right outside the Dole and uh, Social Insurance offices, advising people who are unemployed 
on their their rights and what they could access and that sort of thing, you know. And when the strike uh, happened, um, the comrades uh, in um, Tower asked me uh, if I could help out with the food distribution in the valley. So I ended up then uh, down in Abraman Workman's Hall, uh, downstairs, not in the cinema, and um, started helping out uh, organising food distribution for the miners' families. And that was a centre to which people in England and and the trade union movement in uh, London did a tremendous job in organising food parcels and collections, you know, which were brought down. And then uh, I was involved in organising the distribution of that food. And I always recall that every Friday night, the vestry, the uh, hall in in the Institute was opened up for the uh, miners' wives and the families and daughters to come down there and involve them, you know, and um, uh, it, it it helped then for us to get to know what families needed help, and we had to do it on the basis of, well, if a household's got three kids, they need more food than a household with one child or no child, you know, and that sort of thing, and that's the kind of thing that we worked on, and I was given a job of organising that, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And that's what I did during the miners' strike, behind closed doors.